Hi there, I'm Andy Edgerton of the Relationship Management Team at Sennheiser and as part of our Touring Role series, today we're going to talk about monitor engineering. I'm delighted to welcome my good friend Michael Flarty, who is the monitor engineer for Sean Mendes and today we're going to talk very basic general principles of monitor engineering and then just look a little bit further into what monitor engineering actually is. Um, so let's go really basic at first. What is a monitor engineer? A monitor engineer mixes the sound on stage for band members to listen to. So when you go and watch a, a live show and you'll see speakers on the stage or the band members wearing earpieces, the monitor engineer is sending mixes, usually individual mixes to the band members so they can keep in time and to keep pitch to when singing. Brilliant. Because, yeah, I suppose like when... If you're going and watching a concert, you have the front of house speakers and the sound is coming out of the front of house and that's what you hear in the audience. But if a, if a musician or the band on stage uh, are trying to listen to that and, and, and play along to that, it's going to be very echoey and out of time and that exactly, kind of thing. Exactly, yeah. So, so what, when we say talk about individual mixes, what do we mean by that? What is an individual mix? So usually each musician on stage will have their own, say, set of speakers or own IM transmitter, which you can then give them the desired mix, whether it be more drums, more guitar, more vocals. You can then customize their mix so they can get the most enjoyable experience from playing live. So it's, it's, it's absolutely tailored to them. So obviously, um, We'll talk a little bit about so so from the stage the microphone inputs and and various playbacks or anything else that they're using all comes into your mixing console exactly and then you can you can tailor and center those transmitters exactly what it is that they need to be hearing yeah yeah so there's no actual template for what a mu musician should have but as a go-to rule of thumb you normally expect so if if i'm doing a mix for a drummer the drums would be the most prominent thing in the mix and then the bass and the guitar would be a bit lower than that with and a touch of vocal. And then the bass play would mostly have bass guitar. So whatever instrument you're looking after for that player will be the most in his mix with everything dressed around it. That makes, that makes sense, doesn't it? I suppose whatever you're playing or if you're singing, you want to hear yourself a little bit louder than, than everyone exactly, else. Exactly, yeah. So when we when we talk about stage monitors and uh, like what I'm wearing here, I've got one hanging down there. But you know, if you put both both of these in, usually when you be um, listening to your mix and wearing a, a pack, that allows you to be able to go sort of anywhere in the stage and sometimes the auditorium, doesn't it? So what's the advantage of that over maybe if you've just got a pair of speakers in front of you instead? It's more consistent what you're hearing rather than. If you've just got a set of floor wedges in front of you, when you go off axis, you're going to lose some of the tone, some of the de definition, and it won't be as prominent, and you can lose time very easily. And also with in-ears, you can deliver click and count to the musician to even keep more in time as a reference. And what and what about effects as well? I suppose it becomes a bit easier with in-ears to be able to use different effects. Absolutely, um, yeah. Delays, reverbs, that kind of thing. Yeah, so uh, you can even call it a front of house mix. can be done within in-ears because it's so much more controlled. You've got that. It's very little on the limitations. You've got a lot of capability to express your musicality and how much you want to dress it up. Yeah. And what about um, things like feedback? Because obviously that's quite a problem with, with, with floor wedges or monitors or, how, you know, whatever to fold back, I guess they used to call it in the, yeah. in the days gone by. But I, you, you'd always hear the squeal on stage, the feedback, the whew, and, yeah. and that kind of thing. How, so how, can you talk a little bit about the advantages and disadvantages of in-ears and wedges in, in that respect? Yeah, I mean, when, you, when I used to go in to do club shows or arena shows with, with floor wedges, one of the main jobs you'd have to do would be to voice up the set of speakers so you can get the most clarity out of it, but also keep all the energy in as much as you can. And that was a big task, especially on a, if you've got a lot of reflections and it's bouncing down the microphone, causing feedback to happen. And now it's changed with in-ears, you've now got to do a radio plot 
coordinate a radio plot which is safe and legal in some countries um, and just make sure that it, it's stable enough to last the duration of the show. Yeah, so uh, so you've you've sat, you've kind of gone away from from one thing, which is making sure that it doesn't feed back and that 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 doesn't interrupt the performance. To now, I guess, stopping when we talk about um, a radio plot like RF, the transmission from the transmitter to the to the receiver yeah. that the the musician is wearing. If that drops out, same thing, isn't it? They yeah, it interrupts over. the performance. Yeah, 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 even, yeah. Even more That's, so because it's more challenging because as soon as that signal drops out. That's the entire reference gone for the artist. Whereas if there's a squeal or a hum coming from the, the speakers, you might just get a nasty look and they can continue. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's a bit more detrimental. Brilliant. And obviously, you know, you, you mix um, Sean Mendes. That's the current, the current show that you're working yeah. on. So t what, what does Sean's mix sound like? So very much like the record. You know, when he goes out there, it needs to be an exciting mix. So it gives him the encouragement to go out there and deliver his best. And also on top of that, there's a lot of crowd mics. Because when you put your in-ears in, with the in-ears we use, I think there's a 20, minus 26 attenuation, which isolates you from everyone. So dialing in the crowd mics gives Sean that feeling that he's a part of the audience, a part of the show. So the, the the crowd mics are microphones that are pointing at the crowd. Yeah, there you go, yeah. the ambient mics. Yeah. But you just got to be careful that you don't overcook it with them because what can happen is <clears throat> you can mask the sound of the mix too e very easily and destroy it, essentially. And then you can lose the clarity of the mix and the artist won't know where he is. So you just got to do it at the, the right time of the call and response of the song. Yeah, brilliant. That's great advice. And so when we talk about getting to the point of building a mix, or where maybe we're talking about Sean or maybe his drummer or something, where they you, you've gone from a point of, of nothing to having a mix that they're happy with and comfortable and it, that's exciting and allows them to go and, and perform. What What is the process that you go through to get to that point? Uh, usually in, <clears throat> in rehearsals is a good starting point where you can times on your side occasion usually and um you can sit down with each musician and dial in a, a, a mix specifically to tailor their needs so um that's one way of working around it and also just keeping the conversation flowing between you and the band keep that connection going so you know exactly how you can make them the most comfortable on stage because if they're comfortable they're going to perform better and have a better time. And um, usually it's it's those elements. And then once that's all said and done and you're in the heat of the moment, you're on stage, the band's out there, that's when you really learn how to craft the mix, if you would. Um, that's when you know what pushes to make. If there's a guitar solo coming up or if there's a keyboard part that comes before the pre-chorus to really light up the chorus you know just you learn the songs and after a while it becomes muscle memory of fader movements of where you should go how your board's laid out um and that's how about uh, i start the mix is usually just think you know what would make this exciting to listen to yeah, that's that that's brilliant advice, and and when you said then about the way your your boards laid out, so when when the band are on stage, how do you be available to them, or how do you kind of interact with them when the performance? Because obviously there's tens of thousands of people out there, they're performing, they're in the moment, but if they need something, are they kind of looking across, or is there a little signal that you can that you can interact with them with? Yeah, so initially back before I was doing bands on in ears it'd be all floor wedges it'd be a lot more about eye contact and hand movements or relaying messages to their technicians to pass back to me um but now one thing you do with every band that i work for I'm, 
as I'm doing the input list, I'll be making sure to incorporate a talkback system. So that will be a microphone assigned to each member, and that's technician and band member, um, just to keep the communication up so everyone knows what's going on. Because um, the last thing you want is any little surprises or any hiccups going in front of a, a large crowd. Um, yeah. And to benefit with that, um, it gives you the ability to keep your head up and just keep surveying the scene rather than just head down, being concerned with what's yeah. going on there. Um, but that being said, for Sean, for the last talk, I was underneath the stage. So we had um, monitors, like uh, screens, which had the program feed coming back, relaying. So we had the visual feed of what was happening on stage, where he was on, when he was going off stage, when he was stage right, stage left. And there was just like little things to look out for. You know, if he was leaning out too far, it might catch one of the infill speakers and things like that. So um, that's how we communicated on the larger tour was with a video monitor and tour pack. Yeah, so so those tour pack mics, like you said, if they're positioned at each musician's sort of station or, or wherever, you know, they can they can walk over and just be able to have a quick little word and that'll go straight to your in-ears so that they can give you commands or say, oh, I need a little bit less or a bit more yeah. of this. That kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah. But I suppose being available, I always remember, I mean, that's the way that you're doing it now under the stage and actually watching screens to, to I suppose that's to keep the production kind of clean and yeah. and sort of looking a bit nicer, 100%, isn't it? Yeah, it's all about the, the visual aspect more so than the sonic quality at time. You know, it's it's we can't be seen to have antennas up on some yeah. venues or because, you know, usually they're quite odd looking things so like it doesn't go yeah. in with the set design um so the poor rf technician scratching his head as to where he can go with the <laughs> the runner cable that he's got but um yeah yeah that's that's part of it all i guess brilliant so just let's let's talk a little bit about your your career then so how did you how did you get started in how did you become a monitor engineer oh um so i I was with a company called Adlib Audio for uh, 11 years and I, I really cut my teeth with them doing one-off shows and doing system teching on tours and monitor teching on tours. And then by the end of it, I was constantly doing monitor teching work, which saw me have the opportunity to mix for the band if the number one engineer couldn't make it if there was if you had to go to a family thing or or whatever you're there you're the familiar face stage left that the band see and would be happy to have you behind the board and that's what it came to when i got the early golden show was um i just got the call out the blue yeah brilliant so what what sort of top three if i was an 18 year old kid and i'm looking to you know i'm watching this interview and i'm thinking wow you know monitor engineering sounds something that i'd be interested in in learning and going and doing what where would somebody start what three what top three tips would you give that person to kind of get into you know to get to where you yeah. are really i think a, a big part is training your, your your hearing so you're you're working on your frequencies a lot just for those those moments that we referred to earlier of a speaker feeding back when you go to voice up you know it, it, it's it's very important that you know where the problem is because the longer it lasts the more anxious people get and that one second is long enough believe me so um you want to get rid as soon as um so i'd say mainly with a uh, eq on that front secondly would be gain structure so when the signal comes into the console, you have a, a good gain on giving yourself enough room on the fader moves without it feeding back or becoming too ambient. You've just got that right level of, of control. 
Um, and lastly, I'd say the biggest one would be having an understanding of signal flow. So from where the microphone is in front of the source and how that gets to you and how it leaves. So just understanding that process, because if it was ever to break down, you would, you know, you'd, if you knew where the issue was, you'd be quicker to respond in getting it fixed. Um, so that's my three things, really. EQ, gain, and uh, signal flow. Brilliant. Great advice. Brilliant advice. And then, so once once you've kind of got your head around these and you're starting to learn, what's the next step of getting on tour with the band and being, being able to sort of go around the world or, you know, starting off in the UK or where we, we, where we are and maybe then Europe and then re the rest of the world. How, how would you get into touring? Um, just with hard work, really, and just perseverance. Keep, keep a good attitude, you know, because everyone wants to work with someone who's nice. They don't like an annoying person on tour because you're going to live with them on a tour bus. It's just have a good character and have a good attitude and just keep working at it, I'd say. Um, yeah, brilliant. Well, that leads me on to the to, an, to another question then, or to a two-part question. Like, what is the best piece of advice that you'd say what you should definitely do if you wanted to become a monitor engineer or touring and what you should definitely not do? Um, I think start with the positive would be um, what you should definitely try and do is push yourself to achieve your next goal. Work outside your comfort zone. As much confidence if you, as you've got, just try and nudge yourself forward to achieve that next step. Um, and ask all the questions you can, because the more knowledge you can pick off from people, the better. And people are, are really happy to share information. Like, like now. now, just like um, now. Yeah. And what, what not, not to, to do? do. Um, and the single piece of advice starting out, which not to do, I'd say just try and keep on everyone's good side. Don't don't try and antagonise or the artist or fellow crew members. And also people, it's a very small industry, as large as the live sound industry is. People know each other. So, um, you know, word can get about. Um that is brilliant. I think I think we are. You've you've given some great advice. We wanted this series to be about introducing people to these roles rather than being really technical. We've got webinars on on um, on our Pulse channel that you can go and check out, and on on Sennheiser's website we have loads of education if you want to dig down into RF technicians and and, and get a little bit more technical. But we want this series to just be what are these roles and what do they actually do? So you've answered that brilliant and I appreciate the time. I'm going to do a quick fire one then from what we've, um, what we've just said. So wedges or IMs? Without doubt, IMs. Brilliant. Um, indoor or outdoor shows? Outdoor. Rick, why is that? Less reflections. It just seems to be a good vibe all the time at a festival. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. Uh, favorite venue? That's a hard one, but the one that springs to mind is a little theatre in Australia called the Enmo. I think oh, it's in Sydney. Oh, love that place. Yeah. 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 Great venue. Yeah. Brilliant. Excellent. Um, and favorite festival then? Ziggit. Oh, very well organised. Th yeah. In um, Budapest. Yeah. Great festival. Yeah, that one's really fun. Yeah, massive, massive stages and. Yeah, as you say, very well organised. Yeah. yeah. Worst gig ever? Uh, uh, probably one... The the latest one would probably be when my desk broke during the first show of the US tour with Sean, and it, it threw out white noise at unity level <gasps> to all the band in ear mixes during the show. So there's... I don't know, I think there's about... It was at the Moda Centre in Portland, so 12, 10, 12,000 people and the band and Sean are on stage with this oh, no. sizzling noise. And then it took 10 minutes to figure out if, if it was the desk, if it was the stage rack, if it was the IMs, if it was the transmitters. And it turned out it was the stage rack that went down. And then once that got back up and running, 
certain inputs would just drop off. Oh. So like the hi hat channel <clears throat> would just start generating pink noise. Uh, <laughs> snare bottom two would. I mean, of course, all these channels that you expect to have that type of noise. Um, but yeah, that was um, a test in time. But we got through it. That sounds tricky. I guess that's the thing, isn't it? It's it's getting through. We've uh, we've all had shows that are kind of have gone a little bit west, as they say, and it's just about getting to mm-hmm. the end. And what you've said about you know identifying signal paths and just that experience is, I mean, ten minutes to identify that is pretty quick, really. When it could be a multitude of things, couldn't it? Um, yeah, exactly. So what's what's the best gig ever then? Uh, best gig ever. Uh, I, I, one of the, one of my favourites would have been when we done the Rogers Centre with Sean, which was his hometown show. Uh, it's a quite a big venue, and it was just a big achievement for everyone involved. It was the first stadium show that we'd done, and it, it was a real tick off the bucket list. So yeah, probably that one. Brilliant. I thought you were going to say Wombats for the best and worst oh, gig. Of course. And, and the best Old and Maccabees. worst gig you've ever done. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Mike, Mike uh, toured with me on, on the Wombats many, many, many moons ago. And um, so who would you most like to work with and why? Is there a, they say never work with your idols, but is that the case? Yeah, uh, I don't know. I've worked with... A, Kind of worked with people either in system teching or, but not directly for them, and it's always been enjoyable. Um, but I'm gonna go. I don't know. There's so many bands that spring to mind, like uh, War on Drugs, Queen Stone Age, Nine Inch Nails. But I'm gonna go the other side of that and say probably Bruno Mars. Right. Because I think it would just be a lot of fun. Yeah. You know, they all seem like they have a good time on stage. Good musicians. Yeah, brilliant. That. It's a great choice. It's a great choice. Thank you so much. We I see that you're you're talking into a six K. You're using that as a backup today as as an audio feed. Is that I am. Whose is that, Mike? So that belongs to Shawn Mendes. So I'm creating, building a vocal rack currently, which has the Sennheiser six thousand, uh, nine four five capsule, and runs into a Universal Audio Apollo X eight. Brilliant. So with that, we have a couple of plugins just to keep Sean settled when we go all around the world. Yeah, yeah. It's just that comfort blanket. A bit of consistency. Fantastic. Yeah, because we we tried the the hardware and it was changing everywhere you went with different valves and it changed too much. So this was the most consistent. Brilliant. That's great. Thank you so much for joining us. This has been incredible. I've learned a lot and I'm sure everyone else watching it has done. Um, make sure you check out the other series that we're going to, the, the other episodes in the series that we are doing on the YouTube channel somewhere. Um, thank you, Mike. I really appreciate it. Thanks for joining us. Don't forget to like and subscribe to see more videos just like this.